I'm Eli Small. I'm very excited to have you with us today. We had the pleasure. Thank you. We had the pleasure of working together when you were director of Center Day Camp for many years. And since then, you've gone on to do many different activities, lots of things going on. Um, can you give us a brief overview of what you're up to now and how you came to the work that you're currently doing? Sure. Um, so I own, along with two partners uh, who are lifelong friends, I, uh, we own the Corsetti's Pizza and Sandwich Shop in Westbrook. It's on Route 302. Um, one of the two partners, uh, and uh, he and I have known each other since we were five, first meeting at Center Day Camp back in like 1980-ish, okay, something right? like that. Yeah. Um, and... I was I was a public school teacher and running camp at the same time and decided I to do something completely different. And the, these two friends of mine approached me and said, what do you think about buying a store? They were looking to invest and wanted somebody who would manage the, the operations for them. And because we all know each other so well, it allowed us to kind of do it collectively. So I'm the the day-to-day -day operations manager, but we, the three of us work uh, collaboratively on kind of almost all of the aspects of, of what we do here. And so um, we actually, when we bought the Corsetti's, it came with an ice cream shop that was attached to it. And after one summer of doing that, we decided we didn't want to be in the ice cream business anymore. And we actually added like a sit down restaurant, bar and grill, American pub fair style food, which is a, another whole saga since we essentially opened during the pandemic. But we're now operating um, two kind of companion business. And Eli, I know you. Sorry, I know you've done um, some work in in developing properties simultaneous to this. Yes. Commitment. So yeah, so um, I did uh, an eight condo uh, property. We we built eight condominiums on a, a tract of land that we purchased in Westbrook. Um, so I did a little bit of real estate development and, and construction. And then, uh, along with the two partners that I have in the Corsetti's project, we recently purchased a building in Lewiston on Lisbon street, which is right in downtown around the corner from city hall and the public library. And we're working on developing that as a mixed use space for both retail on the, the ground level, but hopefully adding some, uh, housing, uh, to the to the stock, so to speak, of downtown Lewiston. There's such a need for housing. I mean, you were really um, you were really prescient and appreciating the need for new housing units um, when you got into this work. Yeah, between Bates and the hospitals up there, there's a, there's a growing community, so to speak, but not a lot of housing to go along with it. But that's I know that's also true everywhere. So. Yeah, I mean, suddenly it feels like it's true everywhere. But I feel I, I feel like you were really on top of understanding that need in a in a um, unique way even a couple of years ago, which is great. Um, you mentioned that you opened the bar during COVID. How has it been to operate any business, but especially that kind of business during the last couple of years? It it has been a challenge. Like I don't think anyone could have predicted. Um, I, I certainly, I was naive going into all of this. I always say, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so I figured I would learn on the fly and it was hard enough learning uh, this business. Um, but COVID really just, it, it was a, a gut punch to the workforce, if, if nothing else. And so labor is, is really hard to come by people either kind of promoted out of this job sector. And there's a lot of people who were working for us who said, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore and kind of dropped out of the workforce. So it made it hard enough on, to our core business and then trying to expand what we were doing um, added other levels of, of complications. We were in a, the midst of construction when, I mean, we had started construction before COVID hit the US. So we saw it at first happened and waited longer than we expected to open. But once people started wanting to go out again, we felt like it, it was safe for us to try to open. And we have created a space where there weren't a lot of other places around that are like what we've created. And so we have like a little neighborhood bar. Um, there, there's some regulars, but there's also a lot of commuters that pass through here and 
it's a place where they can stop in and grab a bite to eat before they head west or on their way into town. That's great. And I, I do feel like there's so much awareness now of the value of those places where you gather informally with friends and neighbors and have a sense of hominess, but outside of your home. Um, and, you know, we took a lot of that for granted before yeah, COVID. I think, yeah, I think you're right. And uh, um, we have, we do have outdoor space. So for people who are still really concerned about COVID, we've got a, a an outdoor patio. I call it the beer garden. Um, it's, nice. We've, we've, we've got like AstroTurf and Arborvitae surrounding it. So um, it, it kind of feels like a green space. And we've done, we did live entertainment. We had bands playing out there all last summer. We're getting excited to kind of ramp that up again. We've done some outdoor karaoke and stand-up comedy events. So we've kind of tried to turn ourselves into a little bit of a destination outside of Portland for people that don't necessarily want to like head into the peninsula or things like that. Great. I know um, you also have a podcast that you started just a couple months ago. Yeah, um, that's really like more of a hobby, fun side project. The, uh, a former uh, colleague, uh, teacher that I also happen to be like pretty friendly and social with outside of, of teaching. Um, but we used to see each other every day and he called me up and he, and he said like, hey, let's uh, let's get together and and work on a podcast. I was like, what, like, what are we possibly going to talk about? And he was like, I got this idea. Um, so we call it Smarter and Harder. He likes to joke that he does things the hard way. And when we were teaching anyways, he would always come in and say like, well, you know, shed some light on this for me. And then I, I would try to lend a smarter approach to problem solving some of the challenges that we had and it kind of speaks to both of us we got kind of got burned out at the same time um, with some of the bureaucracy and initiatives and and he wanted to always just kind of punch his way through those and I would say like well wait let's try this let's try that so that that's kind of the joke of smarter and harder and we talk about kind of local issues what's going on here in southern Maine it's a very interesting um, podcast and I love the the um, perspectives that you guys both bring. Thanks. I mean, we've, we've had some fun with it. We've had some good response. So, um, it, it's been fun to bump into people who are like, Hey, I heard the podcast. I love what, you know, or we've had some guests on that, that we've interviewed and someone's like, I didn't know this about, you know, the, a city council that we had on or the local district attorney. So it, it's been fun. It's great. Yeah. So Eli, you grew up in Portland as a member of one of the families that really was responsible for building the Jewish communal institutions as they exist today. Um, your grandfather Irving, I was just looking at his picture on the wall here at the J, um, yeah. was part of the team who found the property at Center Day Camp and then and then really built the, um, the camp up. Yes. And then your parents were both really active in the JCC. And um, I always love looking at those old yearbooks, uh, your dad. David Small is is, um, is in a lot of them. He was a president for many years and involved really heavily um, for a long time. So as you grew up, what kind of stories did you hear about the community or what, you know, what did kind of that legacy mean for you? Um, that's a great question. I think as a child, I didn't, I don't think I necessarily appreciated the, the legacy of it. I think there were all these stories about um, we, you know, we were members at Temple Bethel. So I grew up going to Hebrew school at Temple Bethel. When I first was going to um, Hebrew school, like elementary grades, we also were using uh, Congregation Sherry Tefillah for classroom space. Mm -hmm. So I, I would go to Sherry Tefillah, which is now uh, like the Portland Squash Center or something like that. Um, but it, as a child, it was like you had... Um, the, what everyone would call the shul and my my grandmother would always talk about um I went to shul and and then we I knew a little bit about this like transition or, or switch to when Temple Bethel was founded and people were were going there so I, I I had some insight to both places but I didn't really know that necessarily the stories of kind of I'm a history, I became a history teacher. So I, I do like kind of the, the, the saga of people were up on, on Munjoy Hill in town at, at the original kind of synagogues and then gravitated um, outward towards Deering Center. And I also used to go to kind of like youth recreational activities at the JCC on Ashmont Street. And people would tell stories about the old 
JCC on Cumberland Ave. And I knew that my dad had been involved in the sale of that building. And he had always talked about how bittersweet that was because it, it, it was such a strong community center. Um, I've heard so many different stories about activities that went on there. I, I, I now, as like as an adult, have run into people who, older than I am, but the non-Jews who were like, oh, I used to go and hang out at the JCC and shoot hoops with, you know, your father or, or, or people like that. So, wow. um, but my dad said like the building was in disrepair. There was, there was nowhere near enough money to maintain it. And so um, he, it, it was, it was sad to sell it, but he was, you know, along with a group of others, like that, they were tasked with kind of coming up with a solution. And so I, I grew up going to Temple Bethel and the JCC around the corner in this little office building on Ashmont Street, where we would have, you know, youth activities or, or have like little get togethers there. So I, I knew that my dad had been involved in kind of all of that. And then when I was in my like early twenties was the expansion of center day camp. And, and he, um, I think played a kind of a key role in some of that development up there. And I could tell at that point about how proud he was to kind of do, be doing this stewardship of the camp property. And so shortly thereafter, someone approached me and said, Hey, would you become involved in, in, on the staff side of things? And so at that point, Eli, you had left for college, you went out of state. Yeah, I went to, um, Syracuse uh, University for a couple years and then actually came back and finished here at USM. Okay. And and what how did you decide to stay in Maine? Was that a tough decision or um no, I think I somewhat kind of fell into it. Uh, I I think I when I graduated high school I had that that attitude of I'm going to leave and I'll, I'll only come back to visit on special occasions and I I went to school I had the, the pipe dream of so many other probably teenage males of um, I wanted to be a, the voice of the Boston Red Sox or something like that. So I went to broadcast journalism school at Syracuse. And um, after two years, I just kind of was like this. I don't think this is a path that I really actually want to pursue. So I came home to regroup and come up with what would be a different plan for myself and then kind of. I had a couple of options and, and thought about leaving town and then just realized things were kind of comfortable. And I, I really did like the community. And so I, I started coaching. I, I used to be the assistant wrestling coach at Deering high school for many years. So I started doing that and I was taking, um, working towards a history, history degree at USM. So it just felt natural to then teach and coach. That makes sense. I mean, and your, your commitment to that really did end up, um, bearing so much fruit in terms of the way that Center Day Camp developed. Because I think as your dad had done a lot of work to raise the physical capacity of Center Day Camp, they really, they almost doubled the size of the footprint um, when they did the Field of Dreams project. But you did a lot of work on, you know, making people more aware of it in the community, building relationships with new staff, and, and I think developing a lot of the programmatic elements of the, of the um, camp that we have now today. Yeah, I think right before I got involved, there became more of a movement within the community to professionalize the, the camp operation, for lack of a better description. Um, and that's not to, to be negative about the way camp had been run previously, but camp had been um, very much community driven. And even when I was a child, it was kind of like, everybody just sent their, everybody in the community just sent their kids to center day camp. It, it was what like all the, the Jewish community did and some non-Jewish um, families would send their kids there as well. But it was more word of mouth reputational that like, oh, there's this beautiful place out in Wyndham where the kids can go and they learn how to swim because it's on the lake. And, and um, it, it, as we got to, you know, early to mid 2000s, you couldn't rest on those laurels anymore. Um, there's so much variety in the camping world. There's so much specialization um, that we had to really kind of 
raise the the profile of camp to be on par and competitive with all the other camps that are out there. And so we got accredited with a, the national um, ACA, the American Camping Association. And that was a ton of work. Um, it was started before me, but I, I then helped with the, the first accreditation and um, along with uh, Amy Breyer, who had been a, a camper and, and counselor with me when we were kids, uh, and a couple of other camp directors that we served under, we really worked hard to kind of make camp seem like it was truly a, a professional camping operation, not just a program of the the JCC or, or JCA. And we kind of joked, um, there's a, an old movie called Meatballs where just like everything is so like strung together and, and done like randomly and trial and error. And that, that camp was like that for a long time, but we really tried to hone things in. You definitely, I mean, you did. And I think the accreditation made it such a big difference in terms of the operation of camp and its capacity to continue to grow. Um, one of the factors that I've talked to some people about, um, even folks who like your um, your dad's age, remember that there was there was active discrimination in camping in the state of Maine. And so, well, I mean, yeah, many families sent their kids um, to center day camp and were really excited to do so. There also was a sense that um, for a, a significant period of its history, it was one of the only camps where Jewish kids could attend um, locally. Uh, and yet there was always this policy that um, they were really clear about that everybody was welcome. So that even though there was discrimination in other camping environments, like that they would be open to any kid who wanted to come um, to bring them from, from Portland. And I, I think that's such an incredible legacy and to think about the ways in which they had that vision for inclusion and diversity from the beginning. Yeah, I, I remember walking the property with Kenny Nelson, who had told me that he was one of the first campers and he had been told that, you know, the, the Jewish kids weren't allowed to go to the other camps yeah. in large part because uh, most camps um, historically were run through like church outreach groups. So the kind of the, the history of camping in Maine, uh, many of them were church-based camps, so they wouldn't let the Jewish kids attend. And so Kenny said that the, the community elders, so to speak, knew that if they could um, let kids play together and break bread together, um, that they would help break down some of those barriers and that they were determined to do it differently than the, the camps that were exclusionary. And so they wanted to, to build a, a place that would be just for kids and that teaching some Jewish culture at camp would then normalize some of the relations uh, for, for non-Jews to, to learn a little bit about um, Judaism through experience, not just through like rumor and, and stories. And, and so I, yeah, you know, I grew up with kids who went to Center Day Camp with me and they uh, were not Jewish, but they knew about like Shabbat because we would sing songs together every Friday at, at the end of camp. And so um, I, I heard loud and clear that there were certain traditions that had to continue when I was working on modernizing camp in certain aspects, but also maintaining some of those core values. And I also worked hard on, on outreach and making sure that there were communities that were kind of underrepresented, both as um, camp families who could get financial assistance, but even in recruiting staff who came from all different aspects of walks of life, just to make sure that that we were trying to practice what the intention, the early intentions of camp were. Yeah, I, I think I mean, which is it's that's such a powerful vision for um, creating something that really goes beyond what you might expect from a day camp setting. Um, it, it's it's pretty spectacular, and I think especially thinking about the ways that um, kids who end up on staff, there's a lot of kids who will go through camp as campers through, you know, 10 or more years, and then will stay and become counselors. And, um, you know, I, when you watch people leading Shabbat, you know, it's raucous and exciting, and they're singing yeah. songs and, you know, up on up on the, the stage or that the, um, the log that they're standing on, you know, many of them are non Jewish kids right. who just really relate to and connect with this material that they've been celebrating every summer for many years. 
Yeah, it's great to see. It's amazing. And I, again, I think it's a really unique dynamic that, that you really helped to ensure was continued over, uh, over time and is still in place today. It's really special. Well, I haven't been for a couple of summers, especially because of COVID. So yeah. um, hopefully there will be an opportunity in the near future to go to Shabbat service and check it out. It'd be fun Definitely. To um, but Eli, you've remained involved in the Jewish community. I know your kids came through Temple Beth El's Hebrew school and, um, what motivated you to continue well, and to commit the kind of time and resources that it, that's necessary to have them raised with that level of Jewish identity and education. Um, I, I mean, I think be, because it, whether it was intentional on the part of my parents or just the like the way we were as a family that it was such a strong presence in my life as part of my own identity growing up that I felt like I wanted to give that to to my kids um so I guess there's some like Jewish guilt of I like it can't stop with me I have to at least put in the effort to like keep this going um on, on one level but on another level it's like it it, it I learned to swim at camp and I learned, um, you know, certain values going to Hebrew school as a kid. And that was, if I'm going to be living here, especially as a part of kind of the community I grew up in, then I wanted to, to keep it going and, and have my children be a part of it and see some of the same experiences that I had growing up. And so um, I've, I've tried to stay involved as as much as possible it's really hard i mean that you know it's not like the 1950s when everyone just walked to the synagogue and everyone lived within walking distance i mean we've got my own kids have friends who are jewish who live in different towns and it, it it's definitely the times have changed um but it was important for me to try to maintain as as much of the the tradition as i could it has to be intentional in such a different way than it used to be. It's not baked in um, no. socially or or in terms of like timing, you know, your calendar. Um, I, I think, I mean, you talked a little bit about um, the ways in which you helped to modernize camp. And I feel like there's, it can be really hard to balance the sense of responsibility to legacy and to, and to continuation of a tradition with this maybe more youthful imperative to like generate change and to be part of of making things better and making things your own. Um, how do you think about navigating those two impulses within the community now? You mean like for a camp or just in general? In, in general, like, yeah. In, like, Yeah, I mean, I often work on the weekends because I have to, um, whether whether I want to or not. And so uh, the, the profession that, that I've gone into now is, um, doesn't you know take Saturday off for Shabbat and I, I know other Jewish families who are in the same boat I know Jewish families who own businesses and they have to work on the weekends and I think you, it, it would be nice if Judaism was more than just like the big holidays but sometimes that you have to be okay with that's the best that you can do in the moment yeah and I, I mean I didn't grow up necessarily with like the lights were off in the house and, and, you know, no TV on, on Saturdays or, or, or something like that. But um, I don't necessarily in my own home practice it anywhere near as much as I did growing up, but um, you know, I, we do our, our best to, um, my, I made sure that my two sons had their bar mitzvah and my daughter will have her bat mitzvah coming up here soon and um you know we we try to get together with with my immediate family for significant holidays and we we do some shabbat friday evenings in our house in our own house when we can and so i guess it, it it's it's always there kind of under the surface for us and mm -hmm. we we try to be intentional about it when we when we can stop and breathe and and be intentional i guess yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's a whirlwind um, at the best of times. And I think the last couple of years have not, you know, have, have been so much extra stress, especially on parents and, you know, but also on business owners and I mean, everybody in different ways. Um, I guess as an educator, how do you think we could do things differently or think about approaching um, things differently with regard to engaging kids Jewishly? 
Oh, I don't know. I haven't really given that a, a lot of thought. So I don't think that there's an off the cuff answer for that. It's a hard I mean, question. Yeah, I, I remember. So I, I grew up with one of my, my best childhood friends, uh, Joshua Klein. Uh, he and I, we used to joke because we played youth hockey together. And during the winter, um, we literally would, our parents would send us to Hebrew school in our like hockey uh, equipment. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not joking that we would wear our um, like our shin guards and our and our hockey like shorts with hockey socks on. So we didn't have like the our upper body equipment on, but because it, it takes so much effort to put all that stuff on, and we had such a tight window to get from Hebrew school on Sunday. Sometimes even getting picked up early. Like so, my parents made us go to Hebrew school our parents made us go to Hebrew school and then we would get picked up early so that we could then go to practice and we were already half dressed. We would push and dress in the car. And he and I laugh about that because uh, he doesn't live in Portland anymore, but I said something about, you know, when my boys started going to Hebrew school, he was like, you got to send them in the hockey equipment just for, <laughs> for the sake of the tradition. And it's like, there's so many different, I, my point is there's so many different, um, uh, activities to in life yeah. to compete with and even when I when I was coaching wrestling my head coach would always say like you know kids don't come out for sports anymore because they're too busy with jobs or they're at home playing their video games and so I mean it's a tough sell but I think reminding people you, you got to build on the core values of community and and family and then try to come up with some fun and exciting ways that will want to draw kids in so having you know events at at the synagogue or you know i think there's an opportunity for the jca to to bridge multiple communities because it's a little less um maybe uh, you know affiliative than than a synagogue might be as a house of worship or there's multiple houses of worship but the jca could be where these multiple houses get together mm -hmm. um and maybe thinking about ways to redevelop some of the the teen programming and come up with with some really like fun activities for teens to do um and, and some of them should be probably service oriented and some of them should be kind of experiential so it, you know a youth trip to boston that I know that those are things that had been done in the past. Like if there was a way to kind of gear up for something like that, again, it, it might be a way to draw people in. And then you could have um, teenagers from multiple different communities that are coming together and going on this shared experience. Yeah, I think that's, that's such a great suggestion. And it, it does seem like those, those experiences that are social, but also have some context and in a, in a broader sense can be really powerful. And I think camps, I mean, the, there's been a lot of research, research done in the last several years about the impact of Jewish camping on, yeah. on teens and, and on adults, like on what happens generationally um, in terms of really latching on to some of those values and, and commitments. Um, I love that hockey story. I think that's amazing. That's, I mean, it's, it's a balance, right? And it's, it's right. always been, there's, right. you're, as a, as a parent, you're always navigating a lot of options. And I think you're right. There are more of them now than there used to be. Um, but but you're you're walking this tough line to try to figure out you know how do I expose my kids to all the things I want them to know about um, and and keep them kind of in the mix of stuff and not not miss out on anything. So yeah, I mean, do you want them to be like all the other quote unquote regular kids who are, are doing certain other activities? And if you if your kid has to say like, I can't go to this sporting event because I have to go to Hebrew school when you're in kind of a minority status to begin with. And that sheds such a light on it and kids can be tough. So that, then it's like, oh, you know, what's wrong with you that you have to go do that. So you, as a parent, then you have to try to find the balance. And, and it certainly doesn't make, it doesn't encourage your kids to want to go if they have to choose between hanging out with their friends and going to something that feels like more of an obligation. So there's, there's always like a little dance that has to be done as a parent to, to coax them along. And I went through it on the other side as a child. So I remember it being on that other side. And sometimes I have to say to my, my kids, like, this is what we do. This is who we are. And You'll, you'll thank me for it someday or, or you won't. <laughs> right. I hope you'll thank me for it someday. Right. Um, Eli, you mentioned social um, action and, and kind of giving back. I know that's been a real 
theme for you and your work too. Are there things that you're involved in right now related to that? Or has it been tough to balance those pieces with everything the last two years? Yeah, I, it, it's kind of a missing element of, of in my life right now. I'm not really heavily involved in something that's kind of pro community, pro social, so to speak. Um, and so there, hopefully there'll be time here in the, in the near future for me to kind of um, reassess or, or uh, re-engage with some some activities that aren't just revolving around my business, but as a, as a new business owner, and especially during COVID, it, it's been so demanding of time that that's really been the, the primary focus. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It's, I, it's interesting. I think I remember talking to a couple of people who were other executive directors from JCCs around the country who just said, like, I've done this for 30 years or 20 years. I'm at the end of my career and I've never faced anything like what COVID is throwing at us. And I'm totally flummoxed by this, you know, in the, in the first, even six months and a year, just people saying this is really unusually hard. Um, and I think that's true for business owners too. And so coming in starting something i mean that's it, all of the headwinds that already exist when you're doing that kind of work yeah um, i mean there's no there's no rules i don't want to there's use, no playbook exactly right, right. i don't want to use like survival um it, it, given you know what's going on in other parts of the world it, it it's, it's, um, seems drastic to, to use that expression but it, from a from a business standpoint there was a certain business survival of like yeah. whatever it takes because everything was so unpredictable and there was no way to know what, what was going to happen. And for us, uh, you know, it, we were, we had owned a business for a year and we're planning like a kind of a revitalization or a pivot of adding this bar to our business and, and doing the construction of it. And then COVID hit, it was like kind of, everything else just went by the wayside, all hands on deck, whatever it takes to just keep the doors open. And it hopefully now that the bar is completely finished and, and built and operational, and we've got a year under our belt and we're going into our second summer, um, it will, it will be undoubtedly busy, but maybe um, mm -hmm. there'll be some opportunity to kind of focus on some other activities outside of work. Well, we'll certainly try to get you up to camp. I, if nothing else. I would love nothing more than to come up there and visit this summer. Awesome. Eli, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for having me. Always great to see you. See you soon. Bye. All right, talk to you later. Bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of J Talks. If you have any questions or comments, please visit our Facebook page at Maine Jewish or visit us at mainjewish.org. J Talks is produced by Molly Kern Rolls and edited by Trevor Geiger for the Jewish Community Alliance of Southern Maine. Our theme music is by Sarah Howie Richardson. We'll be back with more episodes soon.